what happened inside the Colosseum. Let's discover the complex nature of all amphitheater events, the morning show, animal hunts, noontime public executions, and the main event in the afternoon, gladiator fights. Such was the activity in any amphitheater throughout the empire. But in the Colosseum, the emperor raised the stakes and offered games and spectacles that were unrivaled. Let's look at the activities inside the Colosseum. Gladiatorial games took place in Rome as early as 264 BC, and it became standard taking place in the Roman Forum as the key location by 216 BC. Now the idea was that the games were a munis, an obligation tied to funerary games to honor the deceased. When gladiatorial games were held inside the Roman Forum, a temporary venue was constructed out of wood filling the entire piazza, about the size of a football field. And it's this elongated shape fitting into that long rectangular piazza of the Forum that eventually gave way to permanent stone structures, the amphitheaters we know from the Roman Empire. And at the same time, the Venationes, or hunts, became very popular in the Circus Maximus, with a growing demand for more and more exotic animals as Rome conquered far off lands. Now by the imperial period, these two components, animal hunts and gladiators, became enshrined in the amphitheater structure. The first stone one in Rome was constructed only in the time of Augustus. When the games took place, the performance began with a pompa or parade of the protagonists. We can see such a parade on the tomb of Gnaeus Aelius Nigidius Maius. We see animals, bestiarii, gladiators holding their helmets, statues of gods carried on litters, musicians, tubicines, and the editor, the person who's paying for the spectacles. Okay, let the games begin. We start with the venationes, or the beast hunts. Who are the bestiarii, or the venatores? They were condemned criminals or prisoners of war, and they were trained to fight wild animals. Now there's some discussion as to just how trained they actually were. Now Symmachus writes about 29 Saxon prisoners actually strangling one another in their prison cells the night they were supposed to perform. Seneca also wrote about a German who to avoid fighting in the games against the wild beasts actually took the sponge on a stick used to wipe yourself in the Roman latrines, he shoved it down his throat to strangle himself to avoid those games. So it was an awful reality. And even though you wore armor and were armed with swords and spears, even on horseback, it seemed like a deadly proposition to combat a bear or a panther or a lion. The bestiari were housed in Rome in the Domitianic era Ludus Matutinus, the morning school, nearby the Colosseum. Was it of lesser value then to be a bestiarii in respect to the gladiators? Well, let's see. Because the games took place in the morning, it seems like it was essentially a glorified warm-up act. Although in North Africa, the games against the wild animals seem to have been more popular than the games against the gladiators. What a spectacle it must have been. And Commodus, the famous emperor who performed as a gladiator, also famously killed countless animals, including beheading ostriches and eliminating hundreds of bears with a bow and arrow. In the Colosseum, the animals are hoisted up and through small elevators underneath the wooden floor, and one has been recently reconstructed to give us a sense of the technology employed by the Romans. After the morning show, the Matutini, it was time for the noontime events, the Meridiani. And noontime was reserved for criminal persecutions of people condemned in a court of law, the so-called Noxii, or captives from war. Now typically, the upper classes would head out of the Colosseum for an extended lunch. And it was the masses that typically remained in the stands. And we know that they consumed food from the concession stands in the Colosseum because archaeological remains of chicken and goat bones, as well as various fruits and seafoods, 
have been identified in the drains of the Colosseum. People were even known to cook in the stands. But the upper classes typically departed to avoid the more vulgar or base violence, namely the execution of captured enemies of war and people found guilty of heinous crimes like murder and arson. The bottom line is that these people had lost their rights, and because of their atrocities committed, they were served up for public humiliation and exacting the rule of law. They were typically burned, crucified, and also thrown to the beast, ad bestias. Now here is a famous example from El Jem in Tunisia where we literally see a person whose arms are tied behind his back and a large feline chewing on his face. You had no chance of reprieve as a condemned criminal. Here is an example from Zlitan, Libya, where you have another person being attacked by a feline and another person who's literally being carted out to the wild animals. It's a way of exacting justice. And also at noontime, that's where the real creative execution of criminals took place. The Noxie, the criminals, took on that theatrical aspect and nowhere was it more impressive than in the Colosseum. But there were many examples of punishments documented throughout Rome and in many venues before the Colosseum. Here's the case of Celerus, who called himself the son of Etna, who led an all-out rebellion in Sicily in the environs of Etna. When he was finally captured, he was put on display in the Roman Forum during the gladiatorial games, and he was put in a cage atop a contraption that looked like Mount Etna. And when it was time to kill him, the actual shell of the volcano dropped away and it was revealed there was a large cage filled with wild animals. Then Celerus was dropped into that horrific environment torn apart by wild beasts. Such was the ending of the man who claimed to be the son of Etna. In Nero's wooden amphitheater that preceded the construction of the Colosseum, we're told the story of a man swung around as Icarus flying with his wings with his father Daedalus. Icarus came crashing down into the arena and literally his blood splashed out and splattered the Emperor Nero himself. Other amphitheater games recall a criminal being castrated publicly following the myth of the god Attis who was driven mad and castrated himself to please the goddess Kibele. Now, in the Colosseum itself, we have documented, reenacted myths in the Book of the Spectacles written by Marshall during the inauguration games of the Colosseum. We have the spectacle of a criminal, a woman, dressed up as Pacify, who was made love to by a bull, according to the myth of Daedalus and Minos, and it was enacted in the arena floor. There's the Roman Republican tale of the defiant Scaevola, who actually put his hand in a fire and it melted away as he defied his captors, the Etruscans. Now a criminal did the same act, his hand thrust into fire until it melted away. Marshall also records the story of Orpheus, the musician who was so talented he could charm wild animals. But in this case, a criminal was dressed up as Orpheus. He was literally torn apart by wild animals. He also then recounts the story of Laureolus, a noted brigand who's chained up like Prometheus. But instead of having his liver pecked out by an eagle, he was mauled to death by a Scottish bear. Again, it's that inventiveness that would take place at noontime for the enjoyment of the crowd, also exacting just punishments. Rome was the law of the land, and you saw justice enacted at noontime in the amphitheater.
And there are many more horrific examples of the inventive persecutions of the Romans throughout the Roman Empire. We see many of those scenes depicted in the 5th century church on the Caelian Hill, San Stefano in Rotondo, again underlining just how creative the Romans were in the persecution of criminals, and in this case, the persecution of Christians. But for the Colosseum, there is no Christian tradition that details the persecution of a Christian inside the amphitheater. And now for the main event, the afternoon spectacles, the gladiators. The gladiators would be paraded into the Colosseum from the gladiatorial schools, and there were three built by Domitian for their exclusive use. The most famous of all, the Ludus Magnus, partially excavated, and the adjacent Ludus Gallicus and Ludus Dicicus. Gladiators would also appear from underneath the wooden floor in the Hippogeum area. We get a sense of what it was like to be a gladiator on his way to an elevator shaft, to be hoisted up, to appear before the crowd, much like in the same way that the exotic animals like lions, tigers, bears, and crocodiles would appear. The editor was the host of the show, and in the Colosseum, exclusively the emperor. He had the ultimate say in the fate of the gladiators. The Lanista was the owner of the gladiators, and he would encourage his gladiators' commission for the spectacle in the Colosseum. There was musical accompaniment during the fighting, water organs, trumpets, and more. There were referees with long sticks that they would use to direct and regulate the matches. This was not a slaughter, but rather an orchestrated bout of real showmen and experts at fighting. They were performers and artists as much as trained killers, and they typically fought in pairs. They were usually wearing heavy equipment that weighed up to 40 to 50 pounds, so a given bout in the Colosseum wouldn't last that long. What were the gladiator types that fought in the Colosseum? There was the secutor or the pursuer, who wore heavy armor and was usually matched against the retiarius who was armed with a trident and a net that he used to ensnare his opponent. He was only protected with a shoulder piece called a galeris on his left side. Sometimes they fought against the heavier armed Murmillo, whose helmet had a crest like a fish. So in a certain sense, the Retiarius was fishing for his prey. Sometimes the prey could win. And the Murmillo, in turn, competed against also the Thrakes, or the Thracian, who had a scimitar, a sica, and a small square shield, or the Hoplomachus, who fought with a small round shield and carried a short straight sword. There were also Equites, who fought in the arena on horseback. There were Laquarii, who used a lasso to ensnare their opponents. A Sagittarius, who used a bow and arrow, and a Dimacaris, who fought with two swords. There were other gladiators, some of whom were free citizens that entered as free agents, and also, even on occasion, particularly in the reign of Domitian, women gladiators. According to Petronius and Seneca, gladiators swore an oath at the beginning of their performance, they offered to be burned, flogged, beaten, or killed if ordered. And when they fought, there was that moment of asking for a reprieve. You raised a finger, a digitum, we're not sure which one. And then at that point, the crowd could step in and voice their interest in either the gladiator who was defeated to be given a reprieve or to be executed. And the execution sign was given with polichiverso. We're not exactly sure which angle the thumb was turned, 
but probably was tied in with calls for Ugolatio, meaning to slit the throat of that gladiator. So sometimes the gladiators were put to death. It had to be approved of by the person who paid for the games, the editor, and then that gladiator would be dispatched without complaint. So much were they trained to face death. But statistically, we know that gladiators weren't killed that often in the arena. One in 10 bouts concluded with the actual death of a gladiator. It doesn't mean they couldn't be wounded. doesn't mean they could get hurt. And there were doctors in attendance to take care of wounded gladiators. But the spectacle was mind-boggling in the Colosseum. Both the inaugural games and in the Triumph of Trajan, we are told in each occasion, no less than 5,000 pairs of gladiators fought over 100 days. That's in addition to thousands and thousands of exotic animals, including rhinos and hippos and elephants, were killed in the Colosseum. Such was the grandeur of the spectacles in the Flavian Amphitheater, the Colosseum of Rome. Thanks for joining us on Ancient Rome Live. You can find a lot more content on our website, ancientromelive.org. And of course, you can also donate so that we can make more fantastic content. We're so excited about ancient Rome and empire and all that has been left behind throughout the Mediterranean. Let us know in the comments what you'd like us to make next.